So, Jim, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, can you just start by saying, look, you became the chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Was that always your ambition? I mean, you went to a comprehensive school. Mm-hmm. I mean, could you even have imagined that you'd become a, a partner of Goldman Sachs? And how, what led you there? No, <laughs> not in the slightest. Um, at, 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 the, at the heart of how my life has evolved, I think, I mean, who knows, but I think uh, it relates to a a very key uh, peculiarity of my, both my mother and father's upbringing and where we lived. So my mum came from a Cheshire farming family and my dad came from a uh, inner Mancunian Irish descent publican family. So very different backgrounds. And I'm not entirely sure quite even how they really managed to stay together, you know, or met, even met really. Um, But I guess for that reason, the genes I've got from each of them are quite different. (laughs) And and, and the even bigger uh, coincidence uh, was that uh, we were raised um, on a road called Style Style Road in Gatley in South Manchester, or on the borders of South Manchester and Cheshire. Indeed, my story is exactly that. The road was split down the middle. One side was Gatley, Leafy, Cheshire. The other was Gatley, not so leafy, Withinshaw in Manchester. And we lived on the Withinshaw side, which meant you had to, uh, unless you had a lot of money, which we didn't, uh, you'd had to go to a primary and junior school uh, in an area very close to us called Crossacres in Withinshaw, which is, was and remains very tough. <laughs> And so it meant at the, the most young age, I had to, I, I had daily experiences of dealing with people from very different uh, backgrounds. I would, I would get beaten up at primary school for being called a Gatley snob every other day. Uh, and then uh, I'd go back and at the weekend, I'd, you know, go to church with nice people from Gatley, Cheshire. Um, so it was quite, you know, and of course you never focus on these things till. And maybe it maybe it wasn't relevant, but I think it certainly meant that I had sort of some kind of adaptability to how I had to deal with things. And it sort of, I think, reappeared often through my life. Um, my dad, because of his background, was obsessed about education and because he, he'd had to leave school at 14. And I think somewhere in his own murky past, there might have been other 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 relations that had come from better parts that he'd. He never let us know about it, but I think they'd had good educations and professional careers. Mm. So he was extremely eager for my three sisters and me to have a a decent education, even though we went to a very tough initial schooling. And and so he he essentially forced us to go to university. I mean, the last all I wanted to do, which was another side of where I grew up with these guys, I just wanted to, you know, we have sympathies on football, I think. You know, the famous Red Army, uh, which terrorised Britain in the 1980s, was led by the Withinshaw Reds. And I I was raised at school with a lot. (laughs) So I used to play, you know, the the way to stop myself being beaten up by them was to play football with them. Uh, But so that's what I wanted to do. But my dad was like, no, you got, you know, you're going to go to a better school. You're going to do A-levels and you go to university. And so after that, I didn't really, I, I wasn't quite quite sure what I was going to do and the truth of the matter was um I remained completely obsessed in playing football and having a good time and it was only when it came to the end of my degree about getting a job I thought that sounds like serious and so I actually stayed on to do a PhD and went through the whole as much of social security sorry social science funding I could get uh before I had to take responsibility and I ended up in the city uh, partly to get rid of the debts I had. I didn't, I didn't have the slightest idea w- what the hell I was really doing. And uh, I just gradually got into this path and Goldman was so desperate uh, to hire somebody to replace the one and only David Morrison in the early 90s. They were daft enough to offer me a partnership. Wow, that's a great. And, and that was it, really. <laughs> that's brilliant. I love that. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about economics, but I was just yeah. curious because you wrote that book a co-author of the book, Superbugs, and you yes. were asked by yes. the Prime Minister to chair yeah. the review and anti-microbial resistance. 
is there something in your background that's pharmaceutical or was it just so that so then no it was nothing whatsoever so let me give you a, hopefully a very potted story of that so when i left goldman uh nearly 19 years later uh yeah, and the circumstances of me leaving, I'd, I'd already or, always observed and been quite conscious of the circumstances in which senior people had left. I'd, you know, I'd become, I'd been a partner the whole 19 years I'd been there, which is way beyond the average duration of a partner of about 10 years, I think. And I, I didn't think my ego would pr probably cope with being told at some point, you've got to leave as is inevitable in a competitive place like Goldman. So I decided I was going to leave before I got told that. <laughs> um, and I, and, and I, you know, the moment I chose for whatever reason, it was partly because I wasn't really enjoying chairing GSAM. Uh, it was great because I left with no animosity and no hangups or anything. And uh, I, but, and also I developed this sort of mantra that, because, of course, compared with most human beings, I was very fortunate being a partner of a firm that went public. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to do anything. So I developed this mantra, if it can't be better, it's got to be different about what I would do. And I had no idea what it meant. But it was, initially, it was to stop me being dragged into starting off my own fund or being, you know, getting involved in a fund or whatever. And uh, it, it, it resulted in, and I followed it pretty diligently. So I kept saying no to the things that came that way. And it led me into the world of public policy. So my, my role in everything to do with things I'm heavily involved in now, Northern Powerhouse and stuff like that on rebalancing and so-called leveling up, that originated for that reason. And then on the back of it, I got approached by the Treasury <coughs> on behalf of the PM. Would I lead this review into something called antimicrobial resistance, which I could not even pronounce? <laughs> And the guy that asked me said, before you uh, say what is that and think about saying no, I'm pretty aware that your motto is uh, now, if it can't be better, it's going to be different. And, and when I, my, my wife does have a, a scientific background and she knew about it. And I, as I joke to people, she's, she said it'd be the first time in 30 years, not only do I understand a bit about what you're doing, but I, that I'm also even interested. <laughs> uh, and I thought, listen, this is, seems like a colossal truly global thing uh i'll learn something uh and i knew it would be temporary as a review and i thought and i thought why not and it, it's actually steve the most interesting thing i've ever done in my life oh really and did it teach you much about the pandemic so when the pandemic came yes. were you yes. sort of fully armed and equipped yes. with all the the knowledge or yeah. yes yes is the, i mean not in all aspects but yes uh the, and the reason why i say it was um, uh, probably the most interesting thing I've ever done in my life. It's, it's multifaceted, but uh, linked to that question, you know, I, I had no idea about antimicro... About, it's basically at the core of it, the people, the growing resistance uh, of antibiotics to, to the bugs that live in, in our bodies and in life. Um, and I had no idea what an issue it was, and I had no idea about the scale of damage a world with no antibiotics could be and and our review became famous because we I, what I what, and the reason why they asked me is I is, is because of the brick thing and I they thought I had this sort of a voice in the emerging world where this problem's big um and so what what we did is uh we we redid the 2050 scenario that made the brick thing popular for a world where AMR would escalate to be a serious massive problem and it led us to concluding that by 2050, there could be 10 million people a year dying. That's 10 million uh, and an accumulated loss of $100 trillion. Uh, and so amongst the reasons why I was prepared for uh, the economic and other aspects of, of, of COVID was that, you know, I knew that there was infectious disease things out there that can cause global devastation. And uh, as as... We also, at the end of the review, came up with 29 specific recommendations. One was about much greater, or well, two of them were crucial to this. One, one was uh, wash your hands in warm, soapy water uh, while you're singing uh, happy birthday. Uh, so, so better uh, personal cleanliness, and certainly, and especially in hospital settings or anything like that, is vital to stopping the spread of uh, infectious diseases. 
Uh, and of course, that's crucial to this pandemic. Uh, and then secondly, we also recommended a much bigger use of vaccines. Um, and we learned that there were, pre-COVID, there was only really three pharmaceutical firms really in the vaccine business. And because the economics of it suck, uh, and they all, you know, what I, and it, we'll get into this, I'm sure. I, what I really learned is, a, is a, a massive belief in what I'd call profit with purpose. Mm. You know, having been the chief economist of Goldman through the crisis, I'd seen plenty of reasons to think about that way also. Mm. But, you know, I was shocked when I, you know, we, we said the world could lose $100 trillion if this, these 29 interventions are implemented, which should cost $42 billion, billion over a, a, a decade, you'd stop 10 million people dying. So it's something like a 2,000, 200,000, sorry, 20,000% return. And I, I, I was shocked as to how narrow pharmaceutical companies think. They basically think the economics of vaccines and uh, antibiotics suck, so they don't want to do it, unless governments are going to pay them for it which is what's happened during COVID. Yeah. And I've, I've actually been on, uh, for much of 2021, uh, I was on the UK's G7 uh, Health Task Force. I co-headed co uh, the financing part of it with uh, uh, Manoush Shafiq. And, uh, and um, very interestingly, I was a commissioner on something that became known as the Monty Commission, an independent European commission about trying to make the world a better place. Um, chaired by Mario Monti, and we had some some big views, including trying to restructure global health and global finance. So I, I, it's meant I've been very involved in all that. Well, it's fascinating. I mean, you, you've got your CV. I mean, it, it covers pages. I mean, it was, <laughs> I was trying to figure out, I mean, how could you be doing all these? I mean, imagine some of the stuff that you've now let, let go. But let, yeah. I mean, let, well, yeah, yeah, my life is, that, that the, the Monty Commission's finished. The G7 health thing is uh, obviously finished. So my life's a tiny bit, uh, I'm, I'm not quite as frenetically busy uh, at the moment than I have been for a while. It's nice. Is it, I mean, you should be retired, right? You should be relaxing. You know, to be honest with you, uh, the thought of sitting around, I don't, I don't think because of how interesting and in, uh, professionally my life has been, I think I'm probably in the camp that, that couldn't cope with whatever sitting around relaxing means. I, I think I'd probably struggle with that, to be honest. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. If, you, if United were uh, run or owned by a better bunch of human beings, and there was, I'd be going to watch them every week still. So that I could cut in that world, I'd be all right. But uh, don't tell me you aren't going to the matches. I don't go. I don't. I, I gave my season ticket up ten years ago, uh, out of distaste for the ownership. Uh, I'll, I do go. I go to away games and I occasionally go to Old Trafford because a lot of my mates still have season tickets so I can piggyback on the back of them. And I have to say, this morning, the day we're chatting, we've, we've, uh, we, we've survived the first leg of a Champions League game and I, and I might try and get to the Old Trafford re return and go through the fatalistic, yet again, of seeing United kicked out of Europe while I'm there. <laughs> oh, dear. But, I mean, you must be cheer more cheerful about your team because they're fourth in the league and... Uh. No, no, I'm not. I can't stand uh, the slow erosion of Manchester United's staggering global brand with these outrageous owners. Um, you know, they, they themselves, to, in, in, in a way, that also has influenced how I think about so much. It's a, the ownership of Manchester United is, a, is one of the most live, vivid illustrations of profit without purpose. Uh, it's horrible. So... I mean, the shares are languishing. I mean, the shares have done yeah, I mean, nothing. When nothing. you think about the value of media properties yeah. in the last ten years, the shares have, the shares have done nothing. I mean, in I think they're five percent higher than they were when they first did the IPO. So I mean, obviously, uh, yeah. you can argue the IPO was overvalued, and obviously, the value of the team is somehow linked to the performance on the field. But yeah. so, I mean, are they a good investment now? I mean, no, not no, they're not. Uh, I listen. I think um, it is. I'm glad you raised that because most people, because of how how well the Glazers extract money, uh, and because of the sponsorship deals they did in the past, 
a lot of people seem to think it's been like some massive financial success, but actually any idiot that owned the shares, and I, in this regard, by the way, the background you and I come from, I don't quite get how the clients of a couple of sizable institutional investors that do own them don't give them a hard time because it's at a time when what, what was before the past six months, the best ever era for owning US shares, United's performance has been diabolical. Yeah, I mean... So it's been just as bad as an investor as it has been as a supporter. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I get that. But I mean, you at one point were part of a, a group that were interested in taking over the club. I mean, why has nobody bought it? I mean... Oh, gosh. Well, this is, this is part of the... I, I call it the most unstable equilibrium I've ever come across. Because of the because of the the game of global live media rights, um, there is this staggeringly inherent value for truly global brands. And uh, as I, I expect, one of the things I experienced during those crazy few days of the so-called Red Nights, United's brand is is despite the performance still just astonishingly astonishingly huge the only place i've traveled to in the two years of covid bizarrely was uzbekistan which by the way was a beautiful trip why did you go there uh i was asked by the government to participate in a forum because they 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 superficially appear to be the latest country that's trying to you know sort of do a let's call it do a georgia of the day that you know Ironically, at a time when aspects of the liberal capitalist model are being rolled back, they're trying to embrace it. Uh, so it's very interesting. But I, I, I actually, I said I'd only do it if I could travel around for a week with my wife. And so we went to all the truly historic Silk Road places. It, it was fascinating. But the point of me raising it is that every adult over, over, you know, that could speak English that I conversed to within 10 minutes, the banging on about Manchester United, it was like, it was astonishing. I mean, I kind of knew this kind of thing from my professional life all over the world, but I hadn't quite realised in a place like Uzbekistan it would be. And, you know, and this is, this is, and so um, to get, to turn it to you, back to your question, you know, the, the owners know that, that, that in this artificial world of, of value within media content, United has this massive notional premium. So, uh, you know, if you spoke to a sports media expert, they'd say United's probably worth anywhere from three to six billion pounds today. But the problem is, uh, and the Glazers would sell if somebody gave them money towards the end of that, I think, but there's no lunatic in the world that would do, there's nobody that's smart enough that would do that, who are the few people who have that money. And even bigger, the, the number of people that could actually do that is tiny. Sure. And so it just sits there you know, allowing these people to extract cash out of Manchester United and, you know, the saga goes on and we replace one manager with another. Okay, well, you know, I wish you luck. My <laughs> elder son has become fascinated with football and, you know, he does the fantasy football. And I believe he's a Manchester United supporter, but he won't admit it. He won't tell me what team he's supporting. But... um the, the fantasy football has been really fascinating, actually. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's a peculiar statistical thing. And he's he's quite active in it, you know, so he's quite, he's trading. So I, I, I'm, I'm, encourage, I'm, in, I'm encouraging that. But listen, the reason that we're doing this was you wrote this fantastic article for Project Syndicate about China. Yeah. And you said... You said, well, there's a couple of things that we, you know, people need to be aware of. The 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 crackdown, the regulatory clampdown on Chinese private companies, which obviously the for-profit education sector looks like it's going to disappear and yeah. it's stifling private sector risk taking. And you mentioned um the government having to do well, they've had this very aggressive clamp down on anti-COVID measures and at yeah. some point they're going to have to release that which is going to be a, 
it's going to be difficult for them, I, I, I guess. Yeah. You didn't mention Evergrande. I mean, presumably because you feel the government has induced that and they've got a plan to manage their way out of that for that. But there's lots of things happening. I, in hope, China I hope they have a plan. Down. So what, what you, I mean, you, 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 you talked very eloquently in the article, but you didn't say, well, what, what they should do about it. I mean, what, what can they do about it? So, I and, mean, the, and it's got the, big implications for the rest of the world, right? I mean, what, yeah, hugely. I mean, listen, going back to why, uh, even why I, I got involved in AMR is because of the BRICS thing. And of course, China was at the center of the BRICS thing. And China actually is the only BRICS country that's delivered uh, what we assumed 20 years later. And China's been the single, single most important marginal positive contributors to global GDP for the past 20 years, more than the US. So yes, anything that goes badly wrong in China, uh, economically is going to affect everyone. Um, so you're right. What, what you didn't mention is that the, the real theme of my article was that I'm not sure for the first time in 30 years that I actually understand what's going on in China, policy-wise. Uh, I always, I became infatuated, well, like most people, I became infatuated with China the first time I went in 1990. And I really started to become uh, aware of its great importance during the Asian financial crisis. Uh, and I, 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 and, I, and I, I, I kidded myself, and still do, that ever since then, I've kind of understood their policy reaction function and the broad framework of uh, almost like uh, extremely good risk mitigation and, and very good risk return economic managers. Uh, and it served me well thinking that way until the past two or three years. And uh, I say all of that because I don't know whether they've got a plan about Evergrande and the fallout um, for two reasons. One is because so many people write about the scale of the interconnected issues in real estate and local authorities appears to be such that once you start to have a go at some of the biggest, you know, where does it finish? Yes, well, <laughs> and and then the second bit, which is the more substantive, subtle part of my article, is what is actually really you know they could have done this any time the past few years. Uh, what's what's motivated the timing of all these things? Is it something to do with the peculiar factions inside the higher echelons of the Chinese Communist Party, and it's and therefore temporary? essentially crackdowns on opponents of, of President Xi? Or, or is it indeed some much deeper new philosophical desire to literally get rid of these many, many uh, billionaire-type Chinese people that they think threaten the, the purest model of what they want? And I don't, I don't think yet we know the answer, you know, and there's a danger in what I, I guess another part of my article is and trying to be sort of humble is just to have an open mind. I mean, you look at what's emerged in Russia the past six months, you know, there's a grave danger in thinking you understand where these characters are trying to go. Yes. Uh, and we don't really know what President Xi as a third term guy really wants to achieve is is it that he really wants to sustain the communist dictatorship even more uh to a degree in which actually penalizes private sector wealth or not and we're, you know i think we're gonna you know it's a hugely hugely important question of which how he deals with the evergrande issue is just one of many End, endless pieces and i think you know the next 12 months as often with anything to do with china but particularly because of the timing of all of this is is absolutely fascinating and front and center to china fathom out what's going to happen to the world economy yeah and uh, of course it's even more difficult to understand because nobody's been able to go there right right so, so on the covid thing that that in itself is uh such a, a mammoth t 
test. I mean, it seems pretty obvious from the evidence we've seen in, in at virtually everywhere else with, with Omicron that this is a hugely uh, infectious uh, variant, but it's not, unless you really got underlying problems, that life-threatening. And so the idea that you're going to get rid of that inside your country is just bananas yeah and uh if that's going to be his policy then then china on top of what if it wasn't already enough of an issue with what we touched on a minute ago every other week they're going to be having to shut down some part of china in a significant way to supposedly stamp it out which is crazy yeah oh, i mean the, the, presumably they'll have to they'll, they'll accept that they're you know the the downsides of the omicron virus and and these otherwise i mean hong kong's going to lose right. its status as a, presumably i mean it's going to lose its status as an international financial center no i, I mean it's a, the, the whole thing I, I mean i i'm not a china expert and i'm, I'm I think I think my message is on that is that anybody that claims they are one should be careful of trusting them. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, you you know, we talked earlier about you know you can't get your you can't get inside the head of the leader of a country, whether it's China or Russia, it, it's impossible to understand, and you can speculate, but I mean, uh, I don't know that anybody's going to get anywhere by. By, by doing so yeah, the, the consequences of slower growth in china mm -hmm. therefore are slower growth everywhere i think that's i think that's right i mean i'll try to answer this a bit more simply if you if you look at the past if you look at the four decades to 2020 global gdp growth has been 3.3 3.3 3.9 3.7 and so the last two decades stronger than the first two and the the major not major the dominant reason why world growth was stronger the last two decades was china um so if china uh slows significantly and unless the only other place in the planet that has the potential at some point to make up would be india uh, unless the US suddenly starts growing at 4%, which that seems very unlikely on a sustained basis, the world will go back towards something closer to 3%. Um, so it is as, ba you know, it's as simple as that. You know, China's become a 14, sorry, 16 trillion uh, dollar economy. And, uh, you know, uh, that means that, what happens to them going forward if it goes from 16 back to 10 or if it goes from 16 to 25 that is gonna be the most important thing for the world economy the next decade it's not gonna go down though is it i mean i mean you know let me make sure i don't get things out of perspective myself here there is a there is a very gloomy scenario which which i've i've argued against for the best part of 35 years but some people particularly in the us have been manically on this path ever since uh, famous people that i've argued in public against often and they've been wrong but there is a path where uh china uh makes big mistakes as it's trying to manage these things and that there becomes some kind of balance of payments crisis the rmb collapses uh, and and uh, they get into a vicious circle of debt, fault, uh, capital outflow that they can't control, RMB halves in value, you know. And uh, we've seen some of that in Russia the past two years. Russia's now no longer one of the world's top, in, in, in dollar terms, no longer one of the top uh, 10 economies of the world because of a little bit of this kind of thing. Um, so there is there is a downside scenario. I I I. I Despite my concerns and my sort of openness about not really understanding what they're up to, I, I still believe the Chinese are, are savvy enough and alert enough to nip something like that in the bud before it gets going. As we, we saw a little window of that in 2016 and they stopped it really successfully. Um, so I think that is probably unlikely. The real, the real thing is 
is China actually going to st- get a, to be as big as the US as many people like me assumed? And I, I would say right now in the next decade, that's now an open question. Whereas yeah. three years ago, I would have said def- definitely it's going to happen. I mean, uh, my perception, uh, th- there is a good article in the Financial Times yesterday about President Xi and chasing people, Chinese people who had fled overseas and trying to mm-hmm. repatriate them, yeah. either le- you know, through legal means or through less legal means. And um, yeah. you know, my perception of that was that this is, he doesn't want the capital to flow out of the country. No. And that's part of the reason for, you know, being so um, active against DD and the IPO that wasn't approved, so active against Ant Financial. Yeah. And this is about, you know, keeping the money at home because at the end of the day, if he keeps the money at home, he's better protected. And obviously yeah. the, the, the surplus shrank very significantly yeah. as people, and you could, I mean, you, you could understand if you were in China and you had a lot of money, you could understand that you'd want to get some of that outside the country. I mean, that is. Well, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, as I'm sure you pick up, but I'm kind of reasonably confident that already for about the past five, six years, quite, it's been <clears throat> one way or the other, quite a lot of wealthy Chinese individuals have been either slowly or as quickly in some cases as possible trying to get money out of the place. So yeah. it makes huge amount, makes a huge amount of sense, particularly yeah. if you aren't sure of what the political complexion is going, is right. going to look like. So, right. Right. Um, but, you know, we will never well we'll know in a couple of years i suppose no exactly we'll know we'll know afterwards <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, I, and predicting it is going to be terribly bad but the terribly difficult but the i mean the BRICS more widely probably going to have a good um decade aren't they i mean obviously we're as we speak we're looking at a very um difficult situation in in ukraine yeah but you know my assumption is that we're going to have higher metals higher energy prices india has got the demographics going for it so other than china the other BRICS are going to do pretty well this decade aren't they i mean let me start by just sort of not leaving your audience with a distorted view of where i think china's probably heading you know despite what i've flagged I've no reason to assume that China won't grow by four and a half to five percent the next decade. Uh, it just might be a bit more volatile than before, and that that rate of growth is actually what we assumed would happen this decade as part of the BRICS story. So, you know, I think it's I think that's probably the best starting assumption. Uh, and I, but I think Steve, you make a very interesting. Uh, uh, observation you know we've just gone through the 20th year of the whole brick thing so i've done endless uh media and conference things about about what it means where it stands etc 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 and it's of course against the background of most people basically thinking it was all a bit of a joke and the the second decade was 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 so bad etc etc but when you when you when you point out as you've just done, the crucial role of commodity prices for two of them, Brazil and Russia, that's why they had a brilliant first decade. Yeah. And, and that's why they both had a disastrous second decade. Yeah. Uh, and so if we're in, a, in an up commodity cycle, these guys, another way of thinking about it, these guys have to keep making even bigger mistakes at home to make their economies weak because they are completely commodity dependent. So Brazil and Russia are all... Brazil definitely will have a better decade in the twenties than it had in the tens. Russia, given given the, the the wildness of what's going on, is a little bit trickier. But I wouldn't be surprised if that turns out to be the case too, because oil and gas are so central. Uh, and you're right on India. Um, I'm personally quite disappointed with with the the eight years of, of lack of reform under Modi, but. Their demographics are so spectacular. You know, this place can grow at six, seven percent even without major reform. And if they really did get the reform bug, India could grow by ten percent easily the next decade. So, uh, 
if you put all of that together, a- arithmetically, it's a bit tricky because China's twice the size of the others put together. So what happens in China will affect the average. But adjusted for that, the other, you're right, the other three collectively will definitely do better than they did in the, in the tent, I, 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 I'm presuming. And um, where do you stand on inflation? I mean, yeah, I haven't yeah. heard anybody talk about transitory for a while, but I mean, <laughs> isn't it? You know, I've got three, let's call it, uh, philosophical observations about this. The first one is, you know, I think I think the debate about it itself is is currently another victim stroke highlighter of this 24 7 universe in which we we live in where now even among central banks seemingly given how hawkish they've started to talk everybody assumes we've got inflation forever uh because it it it's been going up more than we've expected and so that means that's it uh it could uh, but it's quite interesting that for certainly the past 18 months, central bankers were constantly saying it's only temporary. Second thing I would say, um, and I learned this for so long in my Goldman years, at least as it relates to the US, uh, I'm an avid follower of the University of Michigan five-year inflation expectation survey, and it's hardly budged. So... I don't think we've got the 1960s and 1970s entrenched circular dynamics yet. Um, and in that regard, I, I, I would say, as part of the second bit, I, I, I'm sort of agnostic. I, I thought it seemed very obvious to me that inflation as a statistical CPI thing would be a lot higher a year ago. But uh, it's not obvious to me what will happen from here, mm. uh, which takes me to my third thing. It obviously depends on policy. And I, actually, I, I was uh, uh, kindly asked, along with three others, to appear before the UK Treasury Select Committee uh, a couple of weeks ago. And in fact, the FT rather naughtily exaggerated quite a few of my comments. I, I did say them, but the FT built, <laughs> built them into quite a thing. Um, you know, if you stand back from it, quite why we have, so, you know, uh, we we should have short rates quite a bit higher, in my opinion. The, the, the days of QE serving any positive purpose have long since gone. And, you know, I was taught when I was doing my basic economics that, the, the, you know, the underlying level of interest rates should should be pretty close to some kind of level of nominal GDP. And so, you know, I would have thought we should be in a world where short rates are a, a, a good 2% higher than where we are. Now, they're not, they're not, I'm not in saying that saying let's raise rates 2% tomorrow. But uh, somehow we've got to get, if we really want to control inflation, we've got to have a monetary policy framework that gives us a chance of doing so. Uh, because, you know, we don't. I mean, look at, Amongst the reasons why it seems to me quite obvious uh, inflation would rise here, and um, you look at, you know, I'm not a monetarist by any means, far from it, but you look at monetary growth the past two years and you look at house prices, you know, classic, classic leading indicators, surprise, surprise, they've been telling you this is coming. Uh, and if we're going to keep pursuing these astonishingly uh, low interest rate easy money policies, then we won't control inflation. Okay, so we can't afford high rates on the debt because we've got so much debt everywhere. And so the balance, I mean, it just seems to me, if you're in government, what you, what you want is to inflate the debt away. Well, you do, what you, what you do want is you want to inflate, inflate it away without anybody noticing. But the problem is because of the 24 seven world that, that don't exist. Here's what, here's what, and this was at the core of my attempted uh, comments to the Treasury Select Committee. I think you, I don't see a way out of that because it, you know, I think part of the idea of having inflation above target for a while, which is kind of what the Fed did with its new shift, in principle sounds great. But the problem with that is it assumes 
uh you know the world of the internet and uh instagram and and tiktok and you know, that people don't follow what's going on i mean you just can't pull these things off with people being ignorant and uh so hopefully the central bankers are waking up to that if, if they really want to have inflation above target for a while just tell us don't <laughs> Don't don't play games because the markets will fear the worst. They'll fear that you actually don't have a clue what you're doing. Well, I don't um, think they do, though. Well, that could be. But here's here's what I think they should really do. I think and it's quite radical. Uh, I think the the the, the 08 financial crisis and the COVID pandemic has demonstrated that the the fiscal debt and fiscal spending things that people like you and I were, were, were taught to believe throughout our education might not be right. You know, there's no evidence that debt above 60% of GDP has devastated anywhere. You know, I think of, think of all the famous people that have lost money short in Japanese bonds the past 30, decades, 30 years. Um, and so what, what I think we really need to get out of this trap and, and with it, the productivity trap is to have a much more adult and sophisticated approach, to, which which require a change by the IMF, but will only happen with a bold Western country taking the lead. Let, let's call it a very modern uh, Gordon Brown golden rule, where where you essentially have separate accounting for government investment spending and government consumption spending. And, and, and if it was done transparently and openly, which, by the way, would allow the likes of an India to spend properly on education and health and not, and not you know, because they don't. A lot of emerging countries, because of this IMF style 1960s, 70s obsession with some low level of debt to GDP, none of these emerging countries ever really spend anything on health or education. So they can't get out. One of the reasons they can't get out of the low income trap is because they can't grow their uh, economic potential properly and neither can we anymore you know going right back to the amr thing in theory because of our review and sally davis the chief medical officer being prepared for pandemics was on the uk's risk register as one of the main priorities hilariously but because we hadn't actually invested in anything when it came to the crunch you know we couldn't cope uh, i mean they this isn't a radical solution at all. I mean, every I don't, I don't think so. But when I accounts for its money in that way, so what? I mean, the government, the government it's, accounts it's, like a cash book. Yeah. yeah. Why, why is that? I mean, it's because just, it's just be, it's just become part of. You know, I'm glad to hear you say that, Steve. Because I sometimes think I'm going a bit round the bend when I get the reaction to this. It's, it's, it's. I think it's just because of it's, it's group think and acceptance of the norm. You know, and as I said. I, I try to talk to senior IMF people about it as it relates to health, because it's bananas, you know, to, 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 to constrain so many countries attempts to truly use national, uh, you know, your and mine taxpayers money to invest for the future, because of some arbitrary level of debt. It's just ridiculous. And because you can't, you can't grow enough to get out of what the debt situation is, unless you have something that's boosting the productivity performance of the country and so you've got to, you've got to break the cycle and the way to do it i think is to have a more truly active role on government investment spending which would mean in aggregate for a while higher deficits to gdp but then you wouldn't have to have such a ridiculously low monetary policy and 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 the debt burden issue of, of going from zero to two percent wouldn't be as it would still be a problem for hugely over indebted consumers of course but it wouldn't be as big a burden for the overall economy but no. if we if we tried to tighten money po monetary policy without that yeah it's going to put us into a recession yeah okay well that, i mean i think that's a very sensible solution but i mean I, I i don't really understand why we've got the system we've got before we go i just wanted to ask you about this charity shine um yes thank you podcast um what I've been doing in the podcast is I've been trying to promote the FT's new financial literacy charity, financial literacy and inclusion campaign, yeah. FLICE for short. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I think I know, I know the guy that's behind it at the FT. It's a great thing. Pa Patrick. Uh, actually, it's the education. Well, it's not Patrick. I personally know it's the 
the editor for education and science. Oh, I think, all right. So, I, I mean, the, the, the champion at FTE is Patrick Jenkins, and I interviewed yeah. him for the podcast. We did a little 15 minute. Oh, that's fantastic. Party. I didn't know that. I must listen to that. Explain about it. And I, I mean, I think, you know, it's one of these, it's one of Warren Buffett's one foot bars. You know, it's quite an easy challenge to, to, to improve. And yeah. people lose money by taking payday loans because they don't understand the idea of yeah. compound interest. So if you yeah. just teach everybody about compound interest, then yeah. a lot of people will be better off, right? Yeah. I, I just was interested because I, I'm not familiar with the Charity Shine. And I, I was reading about it. it. It started in London. You've improved the education standards in poor areas of London. You're now moving it. Yeah. The Northern powerhouse. So, yeah. do you want to just explain? Oh, go, yes. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the chance. Actually, I'm really grateful. It, it goes back to to what we touched on at the start of my background. Uh, you know, I, I went to uh, I, I went to have my uh, primary and junior schooling in a in a very tough uh, environment. You know, and the only reason I kind of really escaped from it is because of my parents. Uh, my dad in particular obsession with education probably quite a few of those kids were just equally capable as I was um, but they never had the environment or the circumstances to get out of it so SHINE is, stands for support and help in education and it's essentially it's now in existence for 21 years uh, it's, uh, it's, it's basically VC for education philanthropy and we try to back uh, initiatives that we think improve the chances of people from the most disadvantaged backgrounds achieving their education potential. Uh, and I'm extremely passionate about it. Uh, we did, we were fortunate enough to come into existence uh, during the early Blair years uh, or, or the middle Blair years. And in particular, uh, something that influenced me quite a bit on all of how we evolved uh, when, when the, the mess of Hackney uh, resulted in the uh, introducing some, something called the Hackney Learning Trust, which essentially uh, just for that borough uh, imposed a new educational authority inside the council. And that was at the core. Uh, and if you reflect back on that 20 years later where Hackney's educational attainment has gone, of, of, of actual evidence that, you know, with the right interventions, things can improve. Uh, and uh, it, it, it not necessarily all because of just shine interventions, but we traveled through that journey with others. Uh, and so we decided five years ago, um, as a VC type entity, what's the point in still just being primarily in London, when actually these days, the severe educational challenges elsewhere, I'm from the north of England, the whole northern powerhouse, so why not do that? So we're now headquartered in Leeds. And we're trying to do uh, a whole slew of different things, increasingly place-based uh, to many different challenge parts of the north of England. I have a very interesting project going on in North Birkenhead at the moment, and we're exploring doing some uh, more intense place-based stuff in Greater Manchester and up in the northeast. Okay, but well, I'll put so there'll be a web page around yes. it, and so yes. I'll, put, I'll I'll put some links in there and and talk about it because i think it's really you know fantastic cause i mean every, anything to do with kids education is something that I, is dear to my heart but before i let you go mm -hmm. i just i always ask people if they could recommend a book so if you're mm -hmm. a young person thinking of becoming an economist what book should they read gosh oh i mean uh I, th I don't think they could do uh much worse than than getting the getting getting hold of a copy of the economist newspaper every week uh or the economist magazine i think the economist magazine is uh is is, is very readable and it's very very topical and and you know it believes in in the basic concepts of economic theory quite strongly uh, uh and so that you know you have to pay i guess i don't know if the economy i think the ft the ft has a, a thing where it's uh uh, giving discounted, if not free access to to school kids to the FT, but does it? I don't, I don't know. The, the Guardian, my my elder boy reads the Guardian. And yeah, but I, I know the FT is on a bit of a quite rightly on a campaign in this. Uh, 
But um, in terms of a textbook, you know, here, here, because of my age, uh, you know, I'm, they're, they're, there must be more up-to-date versions of what I always thought I would regard as the Bible, which is called Macroeconomics by Dawn, uh, Rudy Dornbush and Stanley Fisher. Uh, and actually, one of the reasons why I say that, and it goes back to my own position as an economist and how I think about the so-called profession, I had the privilege uh, of meeting Rudy uh, in the ni- early 90s quite a bit, and mid-90s, and sadly, he, he died a decade or so ago. And I met Stan Fisher a few times. And what I love about them both, as brilliant as they became and their huge global reputations, they both didn't take themselves too seriously. They both had a, both have a stand still alive. They both have a great sense of humor. Uh, but, you know, these two together presided over, uh, I'm trying to guess when, I can't remember exactly when it was first published, so whether it's been updated or not or not. But on the basic premises of macroeconomics, uh, it, there's not much better than, than macroeconomics by Dawn Bush and Stanley Fisher. Why didn't you write a textbook on economics? You know, I've, I have written a couple of books about the, uh, I've written three. I've written two about bricks and I've written one about uh, superbugs. You know, the, my peculiarity, I, I think the whole book, for me personally, the whole book writing experience isn't one of the most thrilling things in life it's you know you, you become you could become a hostage to the publishers they want to drag you around on sort of what i regard as annoying road shows and all this kind of stuff but well, you're, you never... you're lucky you're complaining so i <laughs> i wrote a book and published last year and um i mean it, it, it isn't the only bookshop it's appeared in is in Nigeria, as far as I can, <laughs> as far as I can tell. But I, I didn't. I would have loved to have done, a, you know, a book signing. No, I'm a, I'm a spoiled brat. In that. Yeah, what, so- what, what, what I might do. I, I, I was saying this again to somebody yesterday. Well, if all else fails to me, uh, I might write a book on the uh, a year in the life of a red knight, uh, because in that crazy two or three week mayhem when that story broke some some of the circumstances i found myself and on, on so many big issues of society with globalization business sport and and just being in the middle of this sort of mad global media frenzy about it <laughs> you know one day one that, that i'd rather do that than write a book about macroeconomics no, I think I'd, I'd rather read the book, read that. <laughs> Jim, it is always great fun to talk to you. Um, thank you so much for, for coming on. All right. It's my pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me.